Hello, I'm Susan Navarre of the Fitchburg Historical Society. And here at the Fitchburg Historical Society, we are always being surprised by things that happened locally, but that we've never heard of before. Somehow, over 100 or 200 years, stories and experiences have been temporarily forgotten. But they mean something to us. Either they show us how different life was before our times, or we learn something that gives us a deeper understanding of a place that is a little more complicated than we ever realized. And of course, lots of people looking into their genealogy and family history are learning more truths about their own families that had been hidden. In today's I Remember When show, we will talk with Professor Danette Day of Fitchburg State University, who teaches education, about how parents and grandparents can speak with their children and grandchildren in a way that will help them get interested in learning more about the past. We will also include some reminiscences about events that happened at Riverfront Park when it was first organized constructed and dedicated more than 20 years ago. Our guest is Mary Chapin Durling, who was the community liaison for Fitchburg State University and a driving force for cultural collaborative programs, uh, including the one known as REACH. As we film this in 2022, we're looking forward to a new project where Riverfront Parks Performance resources will be expanded with the completion of a new performance stage shell. We will follow up with a visual essay on two of the buildings that exemplify Fitchburg's interest in modernist architecture during the middle of the 20th century. One of them is the Simons Industries Windowless Factory. It was built in the early 1930s and opened in the late 1930s at the end of the Great Depression. It was an attempt at a more comfortable workplace for its employees in manufacturing, and it was published in architectural magazines around the world. Recently, it has been featured in a book on the development of air conditioning in factories. The other building we look at will be the Fitchburg Public Library, which was designed by Belmont architect Carl Koch and built in two parts in 1954 and 1964. We will also include a slideshow about Fitchburg Olympian athlete Arthur Longshow Jr. It was created by a, an intern from Fitchburg State University for the Fitchburg Historical Society. Now, Art Longjo was an extraordinary and winning athlete who was nurtured by Fitchburg's Finnish community. He was also the namesake of Fitchburg's Longjo Middle School. Finally, we'll wrap up with some music history that's taken from our files. So if people are, start to think, oh, I want to learn more, mm -hmm. and, or they want to help their children yeah. to understand, I mean, I think it's very tough when you're a little kid to imagine that your grandma was ever a little kid, too. And, you know, do you have to have a college education to bring up these questions with your kids and grandkids? Or do you have recommendations for how people start or books that they might want to well, share with their families? I think families? we had talked earlier, Susan, about possibly bringing some resources. So okay. I'm gonna share um, some of the resources that I use in my class with my students. Um, so one of the first, and these are current books. Um, this one, The Year We Learned to Fly um, by Jacqueline Woodson. This is a book, and it's interesting you said little ones and uh, grandparents. And so in this book, there's a, a brother and a sister and a grandma, and they're, um, they're really bored is what the children say. And so the grandma says, you know, put your mind to work here, and, and you can just be any, be any place and anywhere. And it's a time where they couldn't go outside, and they're in huh? a city. So it's kind of like COVID, but it's not COVID. Yeah. And this idea that year we learned to fly, what happened is they learned to use their imagination 
to do things when they were stuck in their apartment. And then they were flying over the city and um, you know, they suddenly, things were different. They could see flowers. And, and so they're doing all of this in their mind. They haven't gone anywhere, but it feels like they've gone somewhere. And, the, and then it goes into talking about the past. Ah. There were times where people had to use their imagination, and, and there is a mention of the ancestors, and ancestors that had to, um, my grandmother had learned to fly from the people who came before. They were aunts and uncles and cousins who were brought here on huge ships. Their wrists and ankles cuffed in iron, but my grandmother said, nobody can ever cuff your beautiful and brilliant mind. And so these are instances where you know you can talk about what's happening today with your children and then bring in um, the possibility of the past. But these are just beautiful books. Um, this is another one and this one's a little bit, this is probably for, I don't know, maybe 10 and 12 year olds, but this really is a wonderful book um, by Shishelle Williams and she talks about your legacy, a bold reclaiming of, of our enslaved history. And this really is wonderful. This is truly about all of um, the history of, well, not every aspect of it, but in a way that's accessible to a younger audience. And it talks about the intellect and it talks about the courage. And what I really like when it comes to present day, so you go back to Africa with these um, people to different tribes, but then she comes to the present day and she tells the history of some of the people, um, the, um, you know, the work of the civil rights activists. Mm -hmm. And then she has people that um, many of us might know, like Maya Angelou, uh, Muhammad Ali, Mary McLeod Bethune, James Baldwin, Barack Obama, Shirley Chisholm. So it, this is beautifully done. So it starts the awareness, just a familiarity with of people the struggle. from the past. And yeah, the of the struggle, but then where we've come with our brilliance and our ingenuity and our grace and our love. And um, so that's another wonderful book. And then there's some here that I teach with the diversity pedagogy and the 10 lenses. These are resources that I use in my classroom mm -hmm. to help students really think about um, how to teach and this 10 lenses is very interesting. I had them do their own lens. And your lens is made up of the layers of who you are, your identity, plus your legacy, and it equals the way you see the world. So what I try to have them understand, this um, theory by Mark Williams, he's come up with 10 different lenses. The reason why it's so challenging to talk about any topic, any issue, is because we see the world all differently. And, and it's our layers. like our race, our ethnicity, our gender, our religion, all those layers mm -hmm. and our pasts that, that we see the world through and then you're having a conversation about something in the middle of the room or whatever. So you wonder why it's so challenging. I don't oh. think, I think we've done the, a disservice by talking about dates and talking about oh, yeah. you know, big events as the things that are mm -hmm. markers. Um, and then glamorizing those things, right? Right. Not telling about the challenges, not telling about the everyday people who gave of themselves, who had skills, who created communities, who had families. So that thing, I think, m is missing. And I think the more we have shows, um, I think about um, Henry Louis Gates and Finding Your Roots and yeah. shows that are just talking about people's generational history and their stories. And they're shocked by finding out, you know, what their own lineage is and what their Absolutely. own legacy is. <laughs> yeah. So you can imagine yeah. if you have no connection to peoples and it's, you're just talking about an area, you might feel a little aloof and not connected. But if it's your own family, you begin with and then yeah. start to unearth history. You know, that's a good place to start. Yeah. We, we were talking about that before, uh, about how exciting it is when you figure out something that relates to yourself or to, you know, in some cases, your hometown, the street you live on, mm -hmm. the place that you're looking mm -hmm. at, that, that it's also connected with the big issues of history. I, I wanted to uh, add something just, uh, just I was uh, on, on Facebook because, you know, we are in uh, Black History Month. People are yep. posting um, a lot of things that they're finding, you know, memes or things that, and I, I saw someone put something about Josiah Henson um, uh, and about, you know, you know stop, it says something like, stop calling people Uncle Tom because, I don't know, if, oh. if people don't know, um, Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, written by Harriet Beecher Still, was one of the, f I think, the first novel in the United States to sell, sell over a million copies. It was also instrumental 
in the abolitionist movement. Yeah. Um, but her, her, uh, the character, the, 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 the character Uncle Tom was based, based. on a, a narrative written by Josiah Henson. And, and what I, what I re responded to someone on Facebook, I said, did you know that Josiah Henson actually came to uh, Benjamin Snow's house twice to raise money to buy his freedom? Uh, and Josiah Henson, you know, uh, you know, the, 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 the wow. character that, uh, that Terry Beecher Stowe created is, the, was not, uh, you know, well representative, uh, representative of who Josiah Henson was. I mean, um, he, sure. he, you know, he escaped slavery, uh, was an abolitionist, he founded a school yeah. in Toronto to, to, to help uh, people who were escaping slavery to get on their feet. Um, so it's it kind of an interesting thing, you know, you just, and people don't even know who Josiah Henson is. Sure. But they sure. know the, the word Uncle Tom, and, uh, you know, uh, and which is really a, a, a slur. Um, and, uh, uh, and, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah but it's, it's tr history gets truncated, yeah, and then, exactly. sure. and then literature creates caricatures and right. or stereotypes, and so it's hard yeah. for people to discern what is real information, and and then they get little snippets, and yeah. um, they think, okay, I do know it. And it, well, it's okay that you think you know it, but then once somebody starts to talk about it, it's really, it, it's really wonderful when you see the aha moments, and yeah. it's, yeah. and it's like, wow, I want to learn more.
not only when is, was it the only one in the state of Massachusetts, but Patricia Schifford, who was the head of the program, came yeah. to the opening, came to the premiere. I mean, we were one of the 15 um, cities that were interviewed as part of the project evaluation. You know, you might be able to Zoom with Francis Wada. It would be really fun to have his th thoughts about it. Um, Absolutely. Because I, I, I kind of, he, he, may, he may still fondly say, well, Mary wrote the grant and then we found out that she wrote us into the grant. <laughs> well, if we could do like the best project, what would the best... <laughs> amazing community project to be but you didn't expect that you would be chosen you were the I was the only one in Massachusetts Many of us think of the 1960s as the first time when we had a revival of country music and folk music traditions. But in fact, if you go back to the early 20th century, even the late 19th century, we see musicians in Fitchburg and around New England doing the same thing. One of the most interesting musicians of this time was Will Ayer, a traditional fiddler who lived in Fitchburg and was an important regional leader for traditional folk music and folk dancing. He was active in an era that rediscovered square dancing and homegrown American music. Ayer was born on Christmas Day in Putney, Vermont, in the years just after the Civil War. He taught himself how to play the violin and the flute when he was a teenager. Even though he didn't own his own fiddle yet, he started traveling to play with dance orchestras around Vermont and Maine. The first time he got paid, he was over 30 years old, and he was only paid a dollar for seven hours. 
for 25 cents more, he played for two more hours, wrapping it up at five in the morning. Will Ayer made his living by selling insurance, but he had many other interests that went beyond insurance. He raised rare gladiola flowers. He was renowned as a catcher in the Vermont and New Hampshire baseball leagues when he was a young man. And he was a president of Fitchburg's Rotary Club and a member of many other clubs. He was very influenced as a musician by the career of Melly Dunham, a fiddler from small town Maine, who was about 15 years older than Will and played the fiddle in an early country music style. Ayer would end up studying the contra dances of England and Scotland and recreating the music for traditional American contra dancing. He started a new club in Fitchburg called the Fitchburg Quadrille Club and played music for them. The club went on to host a festival of all nations, bringing international traditional music to Fitchburg. Will also traveled frequently to Washington, D.C. to participate in the national folk festivals that were held there. Now that you've seen these different approaches to local history, I'd like to share with you an interesting way to start a discussion in your own family about the history that you have seen and lived through. I spoke with a social studies teacher who said that before he retired, he always gave his students an assignment on Thanksgiving Day weekend. It can work for you at any family dinner, really. The assignment was to ask the oldest person at the table to tell you what life was like when they were growing up. We each have a, a treasure chest of stories wrapped up in our memories of childhood. And once the oldest grandpa or abuelita uh, starts to describe their memories, everyone else will chime in too. And the next thing you know, you'll be sharing your history in the family and marveling over how things change without our really noticing it. I hope you will try this in your own history or with a friend or a group of friends. It's a great way to start learning about the history that surrounds us and that we have been witness to. If you'd like to share some of your reflections and recollections with the Fitchburg Historical Society, we are always excited to hear from people. You can write, it, write them down or share old photos with us or contact us to schedule an oral interview where you tell your stories to a local historian. You can reach us at 978-345-1157 or you can send us a letter at P.O. Box 953, Fitchburg, Massachusetts, 01420. It's also possible to send us an email. Our email address is welcome at fitchburghistoricalsociety.com. Or you can even drop in to say hi at our building on Main Street in the Phoenix Building at 781 Main Street in Fitchburg. I'm Susan Navarre. Please join us again soon for I Remember When with the Fitchburg Historical Society. Mm -hmm.